Hadif Hasrad, please tell us, how did you come to Islam? I want to emphasize that we are Tatars, we are already Muslims. When I was a child, for example, my grandmother often used to tell me a story, the story of the Prophets, which was called Kusasal Anbiya, a very famous book among the Tatars. And my grandmother remembered what her mother constantly read to her. Even though she didn't read it herself, she listened to these stories all the time and passed them on to us. When we sat down to eat, she was always telling, like a radio, like you turn on a tape recorder, and it was like a cassette playing, and she was always telling, telling. But as children we thought, why is she telling us all this? About Adam, about Noah, about Isa, and about Muhammad, peace be upon them. We were growing up, school communication, friends. We talked to friends who were Christians, and they told us, what is it with you Muslims? If you were born a Muslim, you were a Muslim. But still, I wondered, why Islam? Why did our ancestors choose Islam? In the meantime, I graduated from Russian Islamic University. Now it is called Islamic Institute. I study theology, I study Christianity and other religions. But still, I took Islam as the basis and I really understood for myself that Islam for me, for my children, for my ancestors is a great value. Allah says, indeed, Allah's religion is Islam. Everyone, after all, can recognize it, can come to Islam to understand it. The Bible and other scriptures mention Islam, and the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, did not deny any of the prophets. On the contrary, he supported all of them and spoke about all the prophets. Even in the Quran, the name of our Prophet Muhammad Sallam, is mentioned less frequently than the names of other prophets. This needs to be emphasized because Allah Ta'ala still showed the whole essence of religion in the Quran, and thus a person can put on a scales for himself. And yet a person should, well, not should, let's say, a person can think of and say that Islam is really the last religion, which Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, brought, and which we all should adhere to. Well, how would you describe your understanding of Islam to an ordinary person? As an ordinary person, I can imagine what Islam is. Islam is called Tartip in Tatar. Tartip means order. A lot of guys, Muslims, Muslim women have such tendency. Islam forbids, Islam permits. Islam forbids, Islam completes. No, Islam has established an order. There is a certain order, and if you follow this order, you will achieve your goal. If there is disorder on your way, if you are driving on the road and the speed limit is 60, but you are riding with a speed 150, for instance, right? There is a chance you will have an accident, you will roll over, and so on. Religion is a science, is the order of our lives. If you follow that order, then you will reach the ultimate goal. For me, Islam is a standard order, the standard of humanity's existence, and the fact that people must always adhere to a certain order. This is what Islam is. Thank you. And just to continue with this question, what does it mean to you to be a real Muslim? Of course, when we say Muslim, the first thing we think of is the ayats of the Almighty. I created jinns and people only in order that they should worship me. The word ibadat in Tatar. When you ask people, what does ibadat mean to you? They say, to worship, that is, to read namaz, keep uraza, pay zakat, and so on. A true Muslim should always remember the Almighty in his heart and show it by his actions. If a person has made a vow to the Almighty that he believes in him, that he will adhere to him, he must show it, he must pray, he must ask the Almighty, he must communicate with him. Even among the Tatars, for example, 
There are those who think in material terms. It is said, read namaz, you should read namaz. It is said, keep uraza, keep uraza. He reads namaz and keeps uraza. But still, the spiritual link between the Almighty and the man must be in the top priority. That means that a man must devote his whole soul to namaz and uraza. Namaz and uraza are the means of communication with the Almighty. In a hadith, the Prophet Sallam says that you should do things as if you could see the Almighty, and even you cannot see Him, you should think that He sees you. This is the ideal Muslim, inshallah. Well, could you expand on this subject, let's say, not inside a mosque, not during namaz, but in the daytime, in ordinary matters of everyday life? How does this manifest itself? When a man comes to a mosque, he may seem like an angel. He reads namaz better than anyone else, keeps to uraza better than anyone else. But in everyday life, of course, when the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, sent Musa to Medina, the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said to him, go and live, go and live. That means, don't show me namaz, don't talk about namaz, don't talk about uraza, go and live. Show the traits of a true Muslim. When you come to the market, for example, when you haggle, when you give change, be accurate, so be fair. It is in everyday life that a person should show Islam. In the mosque, during prayers, during uraza, it is individual, personal, between a person and the Almighty. And in everyday life, he has to show that he is a Muslim. A very interesting point about nafs, because the material existence of mankind is directly dependent on nafs. But nafs is the place where ahirat and dunya struggle, thus this struggle between ahirat and dunya takes place exactly in nafs, in iman. In this way, nafs helps a person to achieve certain levels in everyday life, but for ahirat, that is, for the other world, where we will go after our death, of course, nafs. A kind of material nafs hinders it. Of course, a person should strive to read namaz more, to keep the uraza more, to worship the Almighty more, and to read the Quran more. There is a certain white envy among people in this, and there is a part of nafs in this as well. But the most important thing is that people mostly attach their nafs to worldly things. What is the point here? When someone puts up a fence, he also needs a fence, but better. Someone bought a car, he needs a car, but better. He needs a house, but better. You see? In this case, nafs plays a destructive role for a person, for a human soul. If a person is not religious, not with iman, if a person does not have his own certain methods of restraining his nafs, a person can be lost. Basically, people come to Islam when they have some problems. There is a problem. A person begins to seek, begins to study, and thus comes to this or that religion, or to this or that niche. In the case when a person just comes to Islam, what can he occupy himself with? Allah says, only through the remembrance of the Almighty, people attain tranquility. The tranquility of the soul, the tranquility of the nafs. Thus, the mentioning of the Almighty helps to be calm and quiet. And mentioning the Almighty means reading the Quran. This is zikr. This is namaz, this is uraza. The worship that the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, instructed us, and what Allah Ta'ala has obliged us to do, they all help us to overcome our nafs, inshallah. Can you share how you felt during the Hajj? When you perform Hajj, one of the pillars of Islam, Allah Ta'ala gives you that feeling in your soul the feeling that you are calm about everything, about worldly things, about home, about family, about a wife, about children, you are calm. How calm you are, 
Even if Neff says that you need a car, you need this, you need that, you always rely on the Almighty. If the Almighty gives you this, you will have it. If not, you won't have it. That's the peace of mind. The Almighty has obliged us to go to Hajj at least once in our lives and thereby understand the essence of nafs. Why do you live? Why do you, for example, acquire worldly things? It's only for existing in this world, minimally or maximally, and leaving for the other world, where Allah Ta'ala, inshallah, is preparing the gardens of paradise for us, inshallah, and all His benefits. You know, I had such a moment, a case in my life. The Almighty speaks in the Quran about the inhabitants of paradise and what the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, was like. Aisha, may Allah be pleased with him, says that the Prophet Sallam, was a walking Quran. When I read the Quran, I always recited the ayats and always thinking that we live in a world where one cannot just go by without thinking about anything. We always have to think about something. For example, even when you're resting, you're always still thinking about how to organize your rest properly, how to go home afterwards, what awaits you there, the rent bill, something else. You have to make repairs. You have something to say to this person, something to say to that one. A person is constantly in some kind of restlessness. And when Allah Ta'ala speaks of the inhabitants of paradise, He mentions that no misfortune, no sadness, no anxiety will overtake them. And this feeling struck me precisely while I was in Mecca, which is what the Almighty is talking about. So the Almighty says about Mecca that it is the safest city. When the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, was leaving Mecca, he said, O oh Mecca, I love you. If I had not been forced to leave you, I would have not left you. And these feelings, the Prophet Muhammad's Sallam, feelings when he left Mecca, they were inside me when we were also leaving Mecca and moving to Medina in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam. And this is the feeling you have to feel having been there. This feeling cannot be conveyed. When I read about it in books, read in the Quran, I cannot feel it in my soul. But when a man walks in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, when you understand that this city where the Prophet Muhammad Sallam walked, where the Prophets walked, where the Sahabs walked, where the Tab al tabin walked, and you walk there too in their footsteps. You breathe the air that they breathed. You see the rocks that they saw. You feel the weather that they felt. It's an indescribable feeling. In the words of the Almighty that it's the safest city. Thus, no trouble, no worry takes the person who stays there. I think that feeling will be with me for the rest of my life, inshallah. Is there anything else you would like to share right now? First of all, you should decide. So, a person either needs to be helped to decide, or if a person has matured, he should decide what he needs, what he wants, what he wants from this life. Or he should simply think, who am I? Why such a hand? Why this face? Why this body? Why the sun? Why the earth? Why do I live? Such elementary questions should directly push a person to determine his religion, the purpose of his life. Why do I live? An elementary question. I think many people think about it, but hide this question from themselves. They hide this question in everyday life. A good car, a good house, good earnings. And then, what's next? For example, I have five questions as my life credo, but all of them are just one question. What's next? When people come to me and say, I have problems in my life, they say, what's your problem? Well, a domestic problem. Some problem, like he needs a good house, he needs a good family, 
he needs a good income, and so on. The first question is, what's next? Just imagine for one moment that you have the nicest house, the nicest car, the nicest family. What's next? The man says, well, move on further. So you moved on. You are the president. And what's next? After a couple of questions, no one has gone beyond the third question. What's next? What's next? I mean, a man must find himself. Why? Because people spend many years trying to find themselves, and many of them die without finding themselves. Many people, for example, save up to buy a house, to buy a car, to buy clothes, to go somewhere. That is their whole goal in life. And when they reach this goal, they don't know what's next. As our Mufti Kamil Hazrat says, why do we read many books? To understand one book, the Quran. All books, all books of tafsir and all hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, shows us the way. Our greatest treasure is the Quran. It turns out that all paths go to one book, the Quran. <laughs>